Rockstar in recent years has severely limited the number of games it wants to release, and has decided to only focus on two specific titles. Because of this, many of its fan-favorite classics have gone without sequels for over a decade, so today I want to talk about two specific games. Games that are timeless classics and that are so unique there may never be other games like it. As always, spoiler warning ahead for both games, as we'll be talking about them in their entirety. Without further ado, let's get started. Our first game is L.A. Noir. It is a detective action-adventure game where you play as former soldier turned detective Cole Phelps, and throughout the game you'll get to experience his story as he solves cases and confronts his past. L.A. Noir's claim to fame has always been in its gameplay. The majority of the cases in this game will start the same way. You'll get a quick briefing from the lead director about the case details, and then you and your partner will investigate the crime scene trying to figure out what happened. After looking through the crime scene, you will then follow any leads you may have discovered, which leads to you questioning witnesses and other suspects. After going from place to place looking for clues and finding answers, you'll more than likely find the culprit and arrest them. Throughout these cases, you'll also have to engage in specific sequences like chases, fights, and shootouts. This is the general gist of L.A. Noir's gameplay. You'll be doing this exact sort of loop for about 95% of the game. This, however, is a double-edged sword, as if you love this gameplay, then you'll love the game, but if you find it boring, then it's probably not the game for you, as the gameplay never changes. This also extends to the game's story. All of these cases are episodic, meaning most of the time the story will start and end within the case. As we start to get deeper into the game, this will change, but for the majority of the game, especially in the beginning, it'll be more episodic. Just like with the gameplay, if you don't like this style of storytelling, it'll be hard to get through this game. On the other side, if you enjoy it, then you'll have very few complaints. It's clear that due to its consistent gameplay and storytelling styles that L.A. Noir was really trying to target a specific audience, and this is probably why the game has received a sort of cult following. But what really sets this game apart from all the others was its facial animation. While well, the actual developers behind the game, Team Bondi, created a new motion capture technology called Motion Scan. This, with the help of 32 cameras placed around the actors, allowed the tech to capture each expression the actor makes. The reason this was created was so that the player could determine whether or not a suspect is lying. The most important part of the game when it comes to the cases is interviewing people, and during these interviews, you can ask people a series of questions, and depending on their answer, you have to give them an appropriate response. The good cop option is for when you believe someone is telling the truth, the bad cop option is for when someone is lying but you have no way to prove it, and accused is for when you do have the proof to prove them wrong. You can listen to how a person speaks, what specifically they say, and also look at the person's expressions to determine if they're lying or not. This was such a unique gameplay mechanic and one I've never seen replicated before, and the fact that this was made for a game in 2011 is all the more impressive. We'll get into the cases a bit later, but besides these investigations, the player is also given the opportunity to partake in side activities such as street crime and hunting collectibles. Except this is where my issues start with L.A. Noir. Despite the size of the map, this is not an open world game. You will start a case, go around town looking for clues and leads, complete the case, then immediately go to the next one. The only time you get to do these activities is during the cases. Already this sounds like a weird decision, as why would I stop an investigation, especially when all the answers are starting to come together just to do some petty street crimes. The game gives you no downtime between cases and no reason to do them during the cases, making these not worth doing at all. There are 40 street crimes in the game, and all of them are more or less the same stuff you do in the main cases, but without a story attached to them. Those other parts of the cases where you have to do shootouts, brawls, and chases will all happen here. They aren't terrible by any means, but given the fact that the game provides no downtime in between cases, you have to do all of these during the investigations, and I'd much rather do these cases as they have an actual story behind them. The collectibles, just like the street crimes, must be done during gameplay. There are over 200 collectibles in this game. I have the same opinion of these as I do any game with collectibles, and that if there's no incentive to actually find these, then there's no point in adding it in the game. L.A. Noir does at least attempt to make them matter, as you can find film reels that have the names of movies from the 40s and 50s on them, and the police badges can give you an outfit if you collect them all. But the only one with actual value is the 13 newspapers. All of these connect and tell a separate story we'll discuss in a minute, and are also found at all the crime scenes, you don't have to go out of your way to find them. Going back to what I said, this game is not an open world game. The only markers on the map are landmarks, hidden vehicles, and places you visited throughout the current case. There is nothing the player can do to interact with the world, like going to clubs, hanging out with your partners, or participating in sporting activities. I don't mind that the developers decided to go down this route with the game, but it makes the world feel like a waste of time. It probably took months or years to make Los Angeles inside the game, only for a majority of it to not be seen. I couldn't name you a single notable place on this map in the 20 hours it took to beat it. If you go into L.A. Noir thinking it's an open world game, you'll be very displeased. But if you go from case to case doing all the investigations and not really paying attention to anything outside of them, you'll have a much better time. 
Speaking of the cases, it's probably a good time to finally talk about them. L.A. Noir, with the inclusion of the remastered edition, has 26 cases the player can solve. Cole will also move through the different departments throughout the game, so the cases will change after a while, going from only homicides to only arsons. Each of these can take anywhere from 30 minutes to over an hour to complete, so you'll have lots of time to not only enjoy the game, but the cases themselves. It wouldn't feel like a proper detective game if the cases were only 10 minutes, so the length of each case is a nice happy medium between being too short and too long. All the cases in the traffic department are episodic, but upon entering the homicide division, things will change. The homicide section of L.A. Noir is a six-case investigation that has to do with a serial killer. The first case is the red lipstick murder, arguably one of the best cases in the game, where upon entering the crime scene, we see a woman who is naked, bruised, and has some writing on her stomach. Cole's partner Rusty claims that this seems oddly familiar to the Black Dahlia case he was previously investigating. However, he further states that it might just be a copycat trying to throw people off his trail, which is a solid theory. By the end of the case, we chase down the culprit Alonzo and throw him in jail. All seems well and good until our next case is exactly the same as before, another naked woman who's been strangled to death, beaten, then marked with some red lipstick. Rusty as well as a lot of other people within the police department seem to think they aren't connected and it's just a coincidence. This is a running theme in this game where Cole seems to be the only competent detective in all of LA as after not only two but five cases with similar crime scenes, everyone still claims it's just a coincidence. Now I'm not sure if this plays into the politics of LA Noir as it tries to highlight a corrupt police police force that's taking the easy way out or just trying to create a headline, but it definitely was aggravating. By the end of the final case, we discover that there is in fact a serial killer, which does not only mean that this guy is incredibly dangerous as he hasn't been caught yet, but that also means everyone we've previously accused has been falsely convicted. This is very problematic and makes this case even more important, as there will be more dead people and more people being falsely accused of crimes they didn't commit as long as this guy is still alive. This all ends at the final mission, where we have to go on a very large scavenger hunt to find the killer. Cole and some of the others in the department have been trying to piece together all these clues he's been leaving us, and we have to decipher these excerpts as they translate to the landmarks on the map. This was incredibly difficult, as once again, 95% of your attention is on the cases, and you probably won't remember where the landmarks are or even what they look like. Regardless, Cole and Rusty will make it to an old church where they find the killer's room, and there is a bathtub coated in blood. The killer makes a run for it, and we have to chase him into a tunnel system, and this is by far the most terrifying part of this whole game. The map disappears in here, so you can't tell where he is. The corridors are tiny with no cover, and there are so many twists and turns that you could end up getting lost down here. The audio was also throwing me off as Cole's footsteps sounded like the killer, so I was on high alert and constantly checking behind me. It was such a fantastic way to end this section of the game, and was a great example of what could happen if L.A. Noir continued with a multi-case story. Thankfully, the rest of the cases do continue into a multi-case story, but before we get into that, I do want to discuss something that does come up in L.A. Noir quite a bit, and it's this game's failure to address, well, failure. The beauty of not only this game, but the detective genre itself is that feeling of uncertainty, and it's this feeling about whether or not you made the right choice that is a staple of this genre. This isn't as prominent when lots of evidence points to one person, but as we just saw, all these clues and leads pointed to specific people, but none of them were the killer. However, this becomes very prevalent when you're forced to choose between two people. The second case in the homicide department, called the Golden Butterfly, was the first case in the game where you had a chance of failure. This was the first time we had to choose between two suspects so at the very least, there is a 50-50 chance we send the wrong person to jail. Now, obviously, we discover later that both options are wrong, but at the time, we didn't know this. It was such a great idea, except numerous times L.A. Noir fails in this regard. During the Golden Butterfly case, after bringing in both suspects, you interrogate both to find out who the real killer is. Assuming you fail both interviews and get many responses wrong, one of the suspects can run out of the room and take off. This gives us a one-star rating on our case, and Captain Donnelly, the leader of the homicide department, will get extremely angry at Cole and Rusty, claiming that if we screw up again, we'll get demoted, and adds that we are to go back on the street and defeat petty criminals to restore some of the credibility we lost. This sounds like an incredible idea until not even two minutes later when we start the next homicide case like it was nothing. While maybe in the game's world Phelps and Rusty had to earn their credibility back, we the player don't, so this just feels useless. This could have played into those street crimes before and provide us with proper downtime to complete these activities. It would also make the game a little harder as now you have to actually be focused on the investigation and the clues or you could lose your job, except this never happens. There was also another time this happened in the advice department where Cole and his partner Roy are told to grab their uniforms as they're back on the streets. According to the Wikipedia for this game, this will only happen if you do a bad interview with Candy, the lover of the suspect, during the case. So you can get everything correct except her questioning and still get a 1 star rating. I would say this is a problem as it's pretty idiotic an entire case can fail from 1 
one specific part, but at the end of the day it doesn't matter as once again we just go back to another case immediately after. To go even further, you can do an entire case and get all the questions wrong and somehow catch the criminal at the end. There is no uncertainty in this game as everything that happens is out of your control. This wouldn't be a problem if this wasn't a detective game, a genre that is all about the player finding clues and solving puzzles to catch a killer. LA Noir isn't the only game to do this, but the reward of catching the killer and knowing you made the right choice is completely nullified once you realize that your choices don't really matter. This, however, does bring up a good point, in that it's you have to meet this game on its own terms rather than your own. The fun of L.A. Noir is finding the clues, questioning witnesses, and finding a killer, and while in the grand scheme of things, what you do doesn't actually matter, if you're playing the game like this without a care in the world with what you're doing, you're playing the game wrong. So if you're willing to overlook this and just play the game like you're supposed to, then you'll have a good time, but it does suck though that this thought will always be on the player's minds, which might dampen their experience. After Cole finds the serial killer in the homicide department, he'll get promoted to Advice, which handles drug-related incidents. The first case started off really strong, where it was discovered that two people overdosed on army-issued morphine. Cole, having a military background, had a lot of knowledge on the subject, and it was really great to learn about morphine through his dialogue. The rest of the department continues as normal, except the last case, Manifest Destiny, involves the morphine again. Already I was hooked, as the Advice department was similar to the previous homicide department, as now there's an actual story, but I never expected it to be THE story of the game. This once again will be the final spoiler warning as it's hard to talk about the rest of the game without talking about its story, so if this game interests you in any way, please click off and go play it. Throughout L.A. Noir, there are three narratives being told. The story of Cole Phelps, the flashbacks of World War II, and the newspapers. Each of these at the start will be its own separate story, but will eventually intertwine at the end. The story of Cole Phelps is the first one we see, and also is the only one that makes sense at first. Cole Phelps was a soldier who returned to L.A. after World War II. He would then need to seek employment, so he decided to become a police officer. Throughout the game, we will play as Cole and move up through the ranks, going from cop to detective, then to moving through the departments within the LAPD, like traffic, homicide, and arson. It's during these cases where Cole's personality truly shines, and we can tell right from the start he wants to do what's right, as he believes it's his duty as someone a part of the LAPD to fight crime and catch the bad guys. The other stories are less consistent initially, and don't make a whole lot of sense at the start. The World War II flashbacks take us through Cole's time in World War II, how he rose through the ranks, how he commanded his units, and how he earned the Silver Star for his bravery. The third story revolves around a Dr. Fontaine and a student of his named Courtney Sheldon. Courtney wants to live a meaningful life and a be a better person, so he decides to help out the soldiers returning from World War II. He needs the help of Dr. Fontaine, though, as he is a licensed psychiatrist. The full story of L.A. Noir involves all three of these narratives. On the surface, L.A. Noir is about being a detective, but its actual story is about World War II and how the soldiers of the war have adjusted to their new life. The World War II flashbacks were not a story that was created to give backstory to Cole, but to every soldier in their unit. Cole, since World War II, has always been by the book. He believes there is an order to how things are done, and they need to be carried out without question. However, Cole wasn't exactly the best at being in charge. During the Battle of Sugarloaf, he took lots of men up to a hill to fight the Japanese, but many were quickly killed via ambush. Cole wanted to fall back, realizing this wasn't the plan he had intended, but no one agreed with his decision. He would then see his close friend Hank be blown to bits by an explosive, with Cole being unharmed even though he was only a few inches away. As the morning came, the other soldiers arrived on the hill to find Cole in complete shock from the explosion. It was also discovered that he was the sole survivor of the fight and was awarded the Silver Star for his bravery. However, he feels unfit to carry this as he earned this by being a coward. The climax of the war story ends when Cole orders a soldier with a flamethrower to burn the inside of a cave, while another officer, Jack Kelso, orders him to just cover the entrance. The soldier listened to Cole's orders instead, and torched the entire cave until the unit realized that the people inside weren't soldiers, but just civilians. <coughs> what do we do, Lieutenant? Jesus, look at all the Stop kids! Stop the goddamn screaming! I need to think! And how do you expect to do that, you fucking maniac? They're burned to a crisp! Finish them off. Do it humanely. We are leaving this place. You do it, Phelps! Get your own fucking hands dirty! Ah! I'm out of morphine! Help! Ah! 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 Put these people out of their pain. Now! That's an order! Everyone out of here now. Double time! You two get Lieutenant Phelps to an aid station. Weapon team will be blowing this place in two minutes. Everything that happened in here stays in here. Do you hear me? 
I don't want to ever hear another word about it. After being shot, Cole would then be honorably discharged and then start his life as a police officer when he returned home. While this happened, the war was still obviously going on, but would end shortly after. While on the boat home, the soldiers were talking about how they were going to try to fit back into society, one claiming that he fought and killed for his country just to go back to being a dishwasher mechanic. Many of them wanted new lives as their outlook on life had changed thanks to the war. Courtney thought it'd be a great idea to take all the army-issued morphine they have on the boat and distribute it to the people of LA. They would not only be able to live lavish lives, but they wouldn't have to return to their boring lives before the war. Many of them agreed, and he even got Dr. Fontaine to help with the offloading of the product, except Dr. Fontaine had other plans. See, this story is not just about the soldiers from World War II, but also the general public's opinion about them. Being a soldier is a selfless act that carries very little praise with it. This is shown in Dr. Fontaine as he uses the returning soldiers as a way to embezzle money and commit fraud. He and many high-ranking people in LA, including the chief of police, the mayor, a New York Times editor, and a couple others, were all a part of this group that was secretly going to make millions off the backs of veterans. The entire arson department that Cole gets demoted to is all about uncovering this group's secrets. The group was planning on making homes for returning soldiers, so on the surface it was a generous act, but deeper is where that conspiracy lies. They first needed to find the proper land to start, so they would buy people's old homes and replace all those homes' wooden brick structures with movie prop versions of the same material. They would then use the official documents they create to cover up the fraudulent material and be able to sell the houses for five times as much money as they paid. The only problem is that some homeowners weren't selling their houses no matter what they were given as compensation. So one of its members started a fake contest within his company in which all the winners would be those who wouldn't sell their house. The plan was that while their family was out celebrating their cruise or vacation, they would burn the house down and take over the property rights. To do this, Fontaine would hire a man named Ira to burn them down, and this is where things get crazy. Ira is not only the person who burnt down the houses, but was the soldier who burned down the cave in the flashback, and was the patient Courtney wanted Dr. Fontaine to see as he wanted his friends to get proper treatment after the horrors they saw during the war. This is what I mean when I said everything in this game connects. All these flashbacks, crime scenes, and newspaper readings were all setting up a story that would be in the main plot towards the end of the game, and that story was remarkable and something I haven't seen done this well in recent memory. If you're willing to get through the first half of the game doing episodic cases, then you'll be presented with one of the best stories gaming has seen. It's not a story that makes you question your morals, but it's one that carefully dropped hints as the game went on and eventually wrapped it all up at the end. It's one of those stories that makes very little sense in the beginning until it all comes together at the end and that light bulb in your brain goes off as you remember all the past flashbacks and how everything connects and it was such a wonderful experience. To wrap up L.A. Noir, it's still one of the best detective games in the industry, and I have yet to see it be surpassed by any other game of its kind. Its graphics, while not the greatest looking, are completely overshadowed by the motion capture of the actors, allowing the game to benefit from this both visually and mechanically. You become a real detective thanks to this game allowing most decisions to be done by the player. Whether that's interviewing suspects or finding clues at a crime scene, it takes you through the steps of being a detective and lets your own decisions control the case for the most part. Even the episodic episodes have wonderful stories within them, and this is further helped by how much freedom the player is given during the crime scene and questioning phases as you're figuring the case out on your own. If there was ever a detective game I would recommend, it would have to be L.A. Noir. Our second and final game is Bully, which is also an action-adventure game, but unlike L.A. Noir, where you're a detective, you're instead a delinquent who picks fights with anyone who looks at him wrong. You play as Jimmy Hopkins, a punk who just got dropped off at Bullworth Academy because his mom is going on a year-long honeymoon with her new husband. Originally, I thought this story was going to revolve around Jimmy and how he's coping with his new environment, as I thought Bullworth was full of snobby rich kids who are above petty brawlings until not even two minutes later I saw someone get choked out on the ground. This school and even this game is complete chaos, and it's definitely a game you don't need to take too seriously as almost every line of dialogue has some sort of joke involved. Smash it! Now tell me, Hopkins, is it true you said I was inbred? No, because First Cousins is legal, my friend. Legal. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and just because my elder brother doesn't have a chin and ended up in a lunatic asylum, it doesn't mean anything. Whatever, Tad. Your family is your business. Don't lie, Jimmy. You said Tad was probably a hermaphrodite with that much inbreeding. A hermaphro what? Don't act dumb. You said his mom was also legally his aunt, and that he probably had webbed toes. I don't! Well, just only on one foot. This game also heavily plays into the traditional school stereotypes and uses these as a way to poke fun at them. Early in the game, we get introduced to all the cliques at the academy, and all of them are exactly what you would expect. 
The nerds are people who will occasionally talk to you as if you were a character in Dungeons and Dragons, and the greasers all look like the main cast from The Outsiders. You won't be able to join any of these cliques, but you'll be able to interact with all of them throughout the game. Like I said, this game is not meant to be taken seriously, and I think that's one of Bully's biggest strengths. It has this distinct charm to it that makes the game so special to a lot of people, as you can't find a game like this anywhere else. It's comedy, characters, and missions are a huge part of this game's strengths, and it's without a doubt some of the best parts of the game. One minute you're training with a homeless man who lives on campus, then the next minute you're chatting with Gary about a Halloween prank who's just casually wearing a Nazi uniform. Genuinely, you can't find a game like this anymore. Things just keep getting weirder and funnier and more absurd every minute you play. And it's that last part that's important. This game really is absurd. You get a variety of equipment in this game, and these range from stink bombs and egg cartons to firecrackers and slingshots. All of this can be used during combat, so it makes the fights that much more insane when you realize you can chuck firecrackers at people. Besides picking fights with random students, you can do a variety of tasks and missions. Each mission, whether it's a side mission or a main mission, is marked with a gold star, and these can range from pretty much anything. I actually enjoyed this a lot, as most of the time it's hard to tell which mission is required as all of them blend together. For example, throwing eggs through Tad's house and assisting Mr. Galloway with his drinking problem are both main missions, yet don't seem like they would fit together in a storyline. Some players might see this and then become bored as they're either not interested in the story as it's all over the place, or they're eagerly waiting to do more story content but keep getting put into side missions. While the former is true to some regard, and we'll talk about that later, for the latter this isn't a matter of concern as most missions in this game are 5-10 to 10 minutes. I completed all the story missions and quite a few side missions, which roughly total to around 60 total missions. Despite how lengthy that may sound, these missions didn't take long as I beat the game in around 10 hours. Now 100%ing the game is a different story thanks to the game having lots of collectibles, but at least for the missions, you won't be spending dozens of hours trying to get through the first chapter. And with how the modern gaming market is now, that sounds like a blessing. It's a game that you can play for a couple hours a day or even a week, and by the time you finish the game, you'll feel like you've made actual progress. Besides its missions, there was a lot involved in this gameplay loop, and that honestly surprised me. Given that the setting is a school, there are some time constraints to keep note of. Morning classes go from 9 to 11.30, and afternoon classes go from 1 to 3.30. If you're late to class, the prefects patrolling the school will bust you and force you to attend class. The game also has curfew times, as you aren't allowed to be in the school past 7, and you have to be in the dorm past 11. If you're violating any of these rules, you'll receive a sort of wanted meter in the top right, which will cause the prefects to chase you down if they spot you. Besides these restrictions, the player will also get wanted for violence, bullying, and many other things that violate the school's rules. These at first glance sound rather annoying, but I also found these ideas to be rather smart. These violations not only make the missions harder, but also actively push the player to attend school. Bullworth is an academy after all, and it wouldn't make much sense for the player to not get punished for skipping class. For example, when the player enters Chapter 2, the town of Bullworth is now accessible to them. I started my day by fighting some preppies after Gary ticked them off. After this, I got to help a girl get front row seats to a movie, and then made my way to the carnival where I watched a midget beat up on a gnome. This was during that gap in the morning and afternoon where I had classes, so the police were actively looking for me because I was skipping class. Granted, it's a lot easier to evade them than the prefects on campus, but still, I wasn't able to completely roam the map carefree. I then took the girl from the movie out on a date, and then caught my PE teacher coming out of an adult store. Not only does this reinforce how much you can get done in such a short amount of time, as while in-game this lasted a whole day, it was really just 30 minutes, but this also led to one of the most stressful moments in this game I ever had. There is one final time restriction this game has, and it's at 2am, where Jimmy will collapse from exhaustion and be forced to wake up the next morning in his bed. Only once did I ever stay out this late, but the one time I did, I was racing against the clock. That PE teacher from earlier wanted me to sneak into the girls' dorm to get their laundry. By the time I had arrived at the school, it was already 12.30, so I had very little time left in the day to get this done. I started panicking as the clock was moving faster than I had anticipated, so instead of sneaking, I sprinted through the halls and managed to complete the mission by 1.40. I then had to race to the dorm room, and by some miracle, I managed to make it in bed by literally 1.59am. Now, I probably hyped it up way more than I needed to, but it goes back to what I said about the time constraints and how they make these missions harder. This sort of thing doesn't happen all the time, but for something a bit more common, you'll sometimes be running around the school after hours or even during class time. So while you need to go pick people's lockers or go to certain parts of the school to start a mission, the prefects are searching for you and trying to bust you for being late. Constraints like this, especially when they're very aggressive, can be more a chore than an obstacle, but in this case, I loved it. Not just the timers, but the other violations were great, and it made the game a bit more challenging. And when the game is more challenging, the more focused you are. And because I was more focused while playing the game, I was actively paying attention to it and appreciating everything it had to offer. 
A few minutes ago I talked about the classes, and those too have their own mechanics involved in them. Bully has 10 classes available in the Scholarship Edition, and each of them have activities that closely resemble the class. English is about taking specific letters and making words out of them, and Music Class is a rhythm game. Each class is a specific threshold you need to pass before it counts as a passing grade, so not only will the activities themselves get harder, but you're expected to perform better as you go through the classes. These were really fun, even if some of them were incredibly hard, but after a while I just ignored them. Once I started becoming more accustomed to the game, I started going to class less and less because I was not only able to avoid the prefects easier, but the rewards weren't as beneficial as I had hoped. Art and chemistry are without a doubt the most important classes, as chemistry provides you with your own equipment in your room, and you can use this to create more firecrackers, stink bombs, and itching powder, while art class increases your health when you make out with other students. Some of the others have their own personal uses, like photography granting the player a photo album, and the gym class increasing accuracy with weapons, but I never found these to be as important as the game made it out to be. The other classes, however, will only provide outfits and are strictly there to give more customization to the player. I have no issue with this as I'm always a fan of customization, but it started to get in the way of the other classes I wanted to take first. What would have helped a lot would have been the ability to skip the rest of the day by sleeping in your bed. This game only lets you sleep past 7pm, and there is no way to skip time, so assuming you only want to take those classes that day, you'll have to wait a while to try again. Furthermore, the game only lets you save at journals and nowhere else. This can be slightly inconvenient, especially if it's a fair distance away, but the most frustrating part is when the game bugs out. Thankfully, this only happened to me one time, but due to the missions being really quick, I was rifling through all of Chapter 3's missions. This specific mission, right at the end of Chapter 3, is where you face off against Johnny Vincent, the leader of the Greasers. The game is supposed to have Johnny slam on the ground and then have the cop show up breaking up the fight. The two will then rush to this junkyard where they actually duke it out. Except I was unaware this was going to happen, and I assumed that we would fight right here in the alleyway. So while the game was loading, I was spamming the weapon wheel so I could get the jump on him with my firecrackers. What happened was that I landed on the skateboard and softlocked the game. Running in this game is caused by pressing or holding the A button, but while holding the skateboard, Jimmy will ride the board instead. However, I don't think it requires an input on the player, as you can clearly see Jimmy running in the cutscene, so the game must have gotten the command that Jimmy was running and decided to use the skateboard instead of just running like normal, which broke my game. I wasn't able to pause the game or do anything but restart, and thanks to that lack of autosaves, I had to do the entirety of Chapter 3 again. This was the only major bug I ever ran into during my playtime, which was nice, but of course any loss of progress is upsetting. As for the checkpoints, it's not that I wish that there was more, I just wish the game handled them a bit differently. Most missions will not have checkpoints, meaning you need to do the whole mission over again if you fail. Initially, it's not too big of a deal since most missions can be completed in 5-10 to 10 minutes, but what the game won't tell you is that you have to go back to restart the mission. For example, in the mission Preppies Vandalize, we find out that the Preps trophies have been stolen and we need to find out who did it. We then have to go across town to visit the Greasers to make sure they weren't the ones who started any trouble. After learning it wasn't them, we check out an abandoned warehouse south of our location and find the culprits responsible for not only the trophies, but the rat outbreak on campus. Everything was going well except I forgot to read the mission objective and didn't realize I needed to not get caught while sneaking inside. I figured this wasn't a big deal and I would just restart at the entrance of the warehouse, except I didn't and I had to restart the whole mission and not only did I have to restart, but I had to start the mission myself. Meaning I had to go all the way back to the gym just to start the mission, then go all the way back to the warehouse, hoping I didn't get caught or I'd have to do this all over again. Sometimes, though, the missions do have checkpoints, but are placed in the most bizarre spots, such as later in the game where we need to bust out Johnny Vincent from the asylum in town. To achieve this, we have to sneak into the asylum without getting caught. However, there is a lot of guards in here, and if you're caught, the game will send you back to the most recent checkpoint. Except it's not in the asylum, it's outside the front gate. So you have to go all the way around the asylum and get over the fence just to get inside the actual building so you can have another try. While I'm grateful that there is at least a checkpoint, I don't understand why it's so far back, when adding it right at the entrance would have just been a much better choice. Originally, I was going to explain these issues, but then defend them by saying how it's simply just a product of its time, as Bully was released in 2006 when games didn't have mechanics like this. Until I realized this game was released the same year as Oblivion and Gears of War, both of which either had autosaves or vast checkpoints, thus making this argument redundant. I'm not sure why Bully opted to go with this system, as it makes the game more tedious for seemingly no reason. Speaking of things that were poor implementations, the last thing we have to discuss is the story. Bully's story is okay at best, but it's not the storyline itself that makes it entertaining, it's the characters. 
The characters, as we discussed earlier, are extremely unique, with different personalities that is easy to spot them at a glance. So many times I would walk around campus and see Algy and immediately know it was him, not just because of his visual design, but because of his unique personality. Meeting with these characters who are cardboard cutouts of specific stereotypes, and then seeing them be the brunt of jokes thanks to that stereotype is great. This even relates to the characters who don't belong in cliques, like Gary, Jimmy, and Petey. These three don't have a set personality that are defined by the game, which means they're even more unique as they don't conform to the general population. Seeing these three interact together is great, as Jimmy and Gary get into heated arguments, and while one is trying to top the other, Petey attempts to settle the dispute, except both Jimmy and Gary will use this time to poke fun at Petey and then go right back to arguing again. As I said, the game's characters are a huge strength of this game, but its storyline does lack quite a bit. During Chapter 1, Gary mentions to Jimmy how he has a plan to take over the school and he wants Jimmy to join him. Jimmy obviously doesn't care for this stuff and just wants to be left alone, but Gary always seems to convince him to help. This comes to an end in Chapter 1 when Gary makes him fight Russell because he believes that Jimmy hates him. Whether it was intentional or not, Gary seems to have created this narrative in his head so that he has a reason to betray Jimmy at the end of the chapter. After this, chapters 2 through 4 are all about recruiting the other cliques so that you have more power over Gary. This starts with the preps, then the greasers, and finally the nerds. Despite the praise I gave the game about how it blends these missions together so it's hard to tell what missions are actually required or not, there is a downside to it. Two of Chapter 2's missions are revolved around you getting ingredients for Edna, the campus cook, and then taking Pinky out on a date to the carnival. Neither of these make any sense and don't further the plot, they are just simply required missions the player must do for no reason. This occurs a couple times through each chapter, but by far the worst part of this story is the lack of Gary in these chapters. After Gary betrays Jimmy in Chapter 1, we see him one time in the middle of Chapter 2 and then never again until the final mission. Petey has more screen time than Gary, and Gary is the antagonist of the game. I don't see how that is possible. It's really upsetting as this decision made the story feel so disconnected and uninteresting. Gary himself was a great villain, and his ability to manipulate people throughout the game was great as it made Jimmy's life harder, but cutting his screen time made his actual presence in the game feel less important. Bully was such a great game as its ability to keep me invested in everything the game had to offer was impressive, and this was due in part to its great attention to humor, its incredibly unique cast, and its game play mechanics that gave the player a sense of urgency throughout the game. But to wrap up my final thoughts, both of these games are quite unique and magnificent in their own ways. It just simply is impossible to choose a better game as they both fill specific niches. LA Noir is for those who enjoy detective games with stellar story and wonderful player involvement. While Bully is a lighthearted game for when you need to have a few laughs, and it also comes with a whole host of distinct characters with great personalities and a variety of missions that have different objectives within each mission, so nothing ever felt boring or stagnant. It's clear that each game has garnered a cult following, and that's what makes this even harder to talk about, as not only will we probably never experience a sequel to these games, we may never experience games like these ever again. Thank you all for watching today's video. If you enjoyed, then be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. Both these games were wonderful to play, and I highly recommend you give them a try if you haven't already. As always, thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and with that everyone, take care, and goodbye.